Well, let us turn to 1 Corinthians 7, and specifically, it's verses 10 through 16 uh, that are the key ones for us. And as you know, in uh, 1 Corinthians 7, Paul turns to address marriage, and uh, we're going to do what we did with Matthew 19. We're going to look at this and see what Paul teaches. And I want to suggest to you that the first thing that Paul teaches is that Jesus' teachings are supposed to be followed. Uh, it begins this way. To the married I give this command, not I but the Lord. A wife was, must not be separate from her husband. But if she is, or but if she does, um, she must remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband and a husband must not divorce his wife. Uh, now, first thing I want to say then uh, is about the parenthetical comment, not I but the Lord. And then in verse 12, Paul says, to the rest, I say this, I not the Lord. What is all of that, not I but the Lord, I uh, not the Lord? Is, does that mean Paul is saying, Here's what the Lord said, and so it's inspired, uh, and you better follow it. Now, here's what I think, um, and you can sort of take it or leave it. It's not inspired. Is that what that means? No, good. Um, right, and, and we know that, first of all, because of the doctrine of inspiration, that if anything shows up in Scripture regardless of who said it or who wrote it, the fact that it makes it into Scripture makes it God's Word, and if it's God's Word, all of us had better heed it, right? Okay. But that doesn't tell us what this actually means. What is Paul doing when he says this? Well, in the interest of time, let me uh, share the answer um, with you, I think that both of these comments are, in fact, if I can put it this way, historical or autobiographical or biographical comments. What Paul is saying in verse 10 and 11, then, is something that Jesus first said, but the fact that Paul is repeating it means that he must agree with it. So he also says it. He's just making the historical point that this part of the teaching originated with Jesus. Now, when you see what Paul says in verses 12 through 16, and you compare it with what's recorded in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you'll say, oh, well, this is definitely something different than you find in the teachings of Jesus. Um, but since God is the one who inspired the biblical writers to write, we can say, yeah, it's Jesus' word as well. But the historical point of who said it first or, you know, did Jesus actually say it? No, it seems like it was Paul who said this, but doing it under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, you, you can be sure Jesus is happy with it too. But these parenthetical remarks do not uh, undermine the inspiration or inerrancy of one single word in this passage. Um, but it also helps us to know where to go to interpret the meaning of verses 10 through 11, right? I mean, doesn't that show us that whatever verses 10 and 11 mean, they have to square with what Jesus taught? Um, so we have a way to test our interpretation of these two verses. Uh, with what Paul says parenthetically in verse 12, uh, we'd have to say, well, I can't go back to the Gospels to compare this stuff with what Jesus taught because Paul is saying, you know, I'm the one who's first writing this. Well, okay, um, so let's see what verse 10 and 11 says. Uh, and incidentally, when Paul says, not I, but the Lord, uh, that confirms the first point 
that I'm making here. Namely, Paul is saying, by making this comment, uh, you are to follow what Jesus said. Now, we'll just see, have to see whether what Paul says in verses 10 and 11 at all fits with what Jesus says and how. Uh, he says, uh, verse 10, a wife must not separate from her husband. Now, um, that verb could be must not divorce her husband. Uh, now, if that is so, uh, wouldn't that contradict Jesus' teaching where he says, if you divorce for the grounds of porneia, you are allowed to do that, and you're also allowed to remarry without committing a sin? Well, that would appear to contradict, you must not, because a wife must not, that's, that's another way of saying, thou shalt not. In other words, uh, divorce is forbidden, right? So, uh, does that mean Paul is throwing out uh, the ground for divorce we saw in Matthew 19? No. It means that um, unless Paul is trying to contradict Jesus' teaching, Paul is not focusing on the situation that is the exception. He's focusing on the general rule. And if you look at Matthew 19, 9, uh, you find, uh, uh, and you remove the exception clause from the sentence, and you consider the sentence without the exception clause, which is what you get, as you know, in Mark's gospel and in Luke, well, that says if a man divorces his wife and marries another, and we've said, the, the uh, idea is on grounds of ervat devar, which means something that doesn't break the marriage bond. Uh, then he commits adultery. Uh, that, that would be pretty serious. And so, in effect, if someone says to me, well, if you divorce your wife on non-biblically acceptable grounds and you marry someone else, you commit adultery, my reaction should be, oh, okay, then I guess I must not divorce my wife. Or I shouldn't divorce my wife. Yeah, you shouldn't. Well, isn't that the basic rule that Jesus sets down? Uh, remove the exception clause from it? Yeah, that is. And isn't that in fact then what Paul must be saying a wife must not separate from her husband must not divorce her husband well why not because if pornea hasn't been committed and you divorce that's a sin and if you would do what most people do after they divorce namely remarry you'd commit another sin you'd engage in adultery and since all of those things are forbidden uh, then we understand why Paul would say, Jesus says, a wife must not divorce her husband. So, is Paul right in that what he is recounting in verse 10 is what Jesus said? Yeah, it's not the whole thing that Jesus said, but it's the basic thing. Um, well, what about verse 11? But if she does... If she does what? If she does divorce her husband, and I'm assuming um, that he means in the case that is under consideration in verse 11, that is, if she does divorce her husband on grounds that don't involve porneia, she must remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband, and a husband must not divorce her wife. So Paul here by the end of verse 11 is saying the same rules that apply to women and divorce and remarriage apply to men and divorce and remarriage.
Now, why would Paul say that if she does divorce her husband, she must remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband? Uh, that wouldn't be the case if she divorced him on the grounds of porneia. So again, and, and remember, Paul is saying he's just confirming Jesus' teaching. So Paul must be, in verse 11, still considering a case of divorce on grounds that are not allowed by Scripture. Well, the divorce shouldn't have happened, but it did. So then what should she do? Should she go ahead and get remarried? <clears throat> well, Jesus said, if you divorce when you don't have acceptable grounds and then you remarry, you commit adultery. So if you made the one sin, you committed the one sin <coughs> of divorcing, don't commit another sin by remarrying. Stay single. You'll at least avoid committing adultery. And you, you, should ha you should stay single for the rest of your life or your other option is to reconcile with your husband. Which wouldn't be a bad thing because in God's eyes you are still married to him anyway. And of course, if you're still married to him anyway, it's clear why you better remain single because to marry someone else is going to be adultery. Being married to one person and having sex with another, that's adultery. Is there anything there that Jesus didn't say? No. So, Paul is saying everything Jesus told you even though Paul doesn't include the exception clause, I think we have a right to do that. Um, there's surely nothing in these verses that say the exception clause, don't believe that. Um, he's not making any comment about the exception clause. So I think we should say, okay, everything Jesus taught, we should believe. And Paul says... It's still in force. But the passage doesn't end there. Uh, now's when it starts to get interesting. Paul turns to address the stuff that Jesus hadn't mentioned in his teachings as recorded in the gospel, but Paul is bringing it up. And what verses 12 through 14 amount to are saying that if you are a believer who is married to a non-believing uh, spouse, the fact that that spouse is a non-believer does not give you, the believer, the right to divorce him or her. You're to stay married as long as the non-believing spouse wants to continue the marriage. Um, how do I get that out of verses 12 through 14? Well, let's see. To the rest, I say this. I don't think Paul necessarily means to the rest of you folk at uh, Corinth, though I suppose that's a possible uh, thing that he might be saying. I think it's more likely he's, he's saying to the rest of the teaching on divorce and remarriage, well, uh, Jesus didn't say this, but I'm going to say it. If any brother has a wife who is not a believer, now you know from uh, your studies already that Paul's typical way of referring to a Christian is to refer to them as a brother or a sister. So when he says if any brother has a wife, uh, that tips us off that he's probably talking about a believing husband. But just in case we weren't sure, he says, if any brother has a wife, and then he goes on to say, who is not a believer. Oh, he's making a point to say that the brother's wife is not a believer. So yeah, he, by calling the man a brother, he probably is wanting us to see that what he's discussing is a family with 
one of the spouses as a believer and one of them as a non-believer. And in this case, he's chosen the man to be the believer and the woman to be the unbeliever. In our experiences, I think most often it's the woman who's the believer and the husband who's not. At any rate, <clears throat> the rules apply both ways, as you'll see in verse 13. If any brother who has a wife who's not a believer and she is willing to live with him, he must not divorce her. He must not divorce her is a prescription. So if you are a believer who is married to a non-believing spouse and that spouse wants to continue the marriage, <clears throat> uh, she doesn't want to end it just because you're a believer, then the command to you is don't divorce her. You don't have a ground for divorce. Uh, well, is that a privilege just for a believing husband, uh, but not for a believing wife who has an unbelieving husband? No. Verse 13, and if a woman has a husband who is not a believer and he is willing to live with her, uh, well, it must be a believing woman. Otherwise, what's the point of saying that the husband is not a believer? Uh, if a woman has a husband who is not a believer and he's willing to live with her, she must not divorce him. Okay. Um, so what this says here is correct. That's the rule in verses 12 and 13. But we're saying that uh, the second point that Paul is teaching uh, runs from verses 12 through 14. So if the rule is in verses 12 through 13, what's in verse 14? The rationale. Here's the ground rules. Now let me tell you why uh, I'm making this command. Verse 14, for the unbelieving husband has been sanctified through his wife and the unbelieving wife has been sanctified through her believing husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. Now, that's not an easy one to understand, is it? So let's unpack it for you. Uh, the thing that makes this difficult uh, is that we know that sanctified, that's part of the doctrine of salvation, and we know what sanctification means in soteriology. And so it seems like what, well, you know that, that someone can't be sanctified in the soteriological sense if they're not first justified, right? Right? But we know that we're talking about someone who hasn't been justified and yet Paul is saying they're sanctified. Uh, how can that be? Is it that Paul is just a sloppy theologian uh, or that he's had a massive case of amnesia? He, he has no idea about the doctrine of salvation and uh, if he's written Romans before 1 Corinthians... He forgot what he said. Uh, no. No, that's not what's happening. Well, uh, then, <clears throat> what does this mean? I think you get help when you look at the word in the Greek that's translated sanctified. And uh, you will note that it comes from the word whose basic meaning is to be set apart. Separated. And when you say someone is sanctified in the soteriological sense of the term, what you are saying is they are set apart, and you mean set apart from sin and sinfulness. Okay? Well, is it possible that someone 
who is not a believer could be sanctified in the sense that they are set apart from sin and sinfulness? Well, not in terms of their own being, but yeah, in terms of their surroundings. Uh, what am I saying? Well, the point that Paul is making is if that non-believing spouse is willing to live in the house with a believer and continue the marriage, then do so because it's surely going to be a healthier, more holy atmosphere in that house than if the non-believer lives uh, leaves and goes out and lives among non-believers. And uh, the comment about the kids means the same thing. Otherwise, your children would be unclean. Uh, they would be living in the muck and garbage that comes along with non-believers' worldview and their way of doing things. But as it is, they are holy. Again, the root word, the word that means to be set apart. In this case, not internally, but externally. So, do you see what the point of the explanation is? And the point of the rule? Don't end the marriage because um, if you don't, you're going to give a more wholesome atmosphere for your unbelieving husband to live in than if he lives among non-believers. And it's going to be more wholesome for your kids to be in that kind of atmosphere where their unbelieving dad is, is not going to be constantly ridiculing his wife and her religion. If he's going to be constantly ridiculing her, her, his wife's religion, then... You know, maybe it would be better for everyone if he moved out. We'll see whether Scripture allows that. We're not at that point just yet. Um, now, what Paul is talking about is something here that I think many of you, if not all of you, have experienced, and I know I have. Uh, let me give you an illustration of what's being talked about. For many, many years, I've had a membership at Health Club. Uh, it's, it's good for me to get some exercise for a number of reasons. And over a period of time, as you go on a regular basis, you get to know some of the people who were there. And a uh, number of years, that was happening with uh, one fella. And... We didn't have any lengthy talks, but he knew enough about me that he knew I was a minister. I'm not sure he knew whether I was a professor uh, at Trinity, but at any rate, he knew that I was a minister and a religious sort. Well, one day I came into <coughs> the gym uh, locker room, and uh, he was there talking with his buddies, and when he saw me, he stopped talking uh, and he turned to me and uh, what he said to me let me know what he had been talking about <clears throat> before I came in uh, he said uh, uh, I was just going to tell a dirty joke would you like to hear it and I said uh, not particularly and so he didn't tell it while I was there I got dressed locked up my locker, and then as I was leaving the locker room to go out to exercise, I could hear him that he started to tell, you know, have a conversation with his buddies, and he was going to tell them that joke because they wanted to hear it. What happened? He knew that I was a minister and a religious sort, and because of that, even though he wasn't an evangelical Christian, he was Roman Catholic, uh, and so shouldn't have been doing that sort of thing. Uh, but that doesn't stop a lot of people who are religious from doing that. But he knew that someone who was a religious sort, and even more than that, a minister, 
would not feel comfortable uh, hearing swearing, hearing dirty jokes, etc., etc. And so, out of respect for that, he remained silent while I was there. And the atmosphere for those five minutes or so while I was getting dressed in the locker room was surely better than the atmosphere before I'd come or after I left if he starts telling these dirty jokes. I think you've probably experienced that where a co-worker uh, is swearing or talking about things that are off color and then you come in to punch in for your, and they, uh, your work session and they see you and Immediately, they sort of shut up, and I say, oh, you know, let's, let's finish this conversation later. Well, don't think that doesn't happen in marriages and in homes. And that's the point. Out of, if the unbeliever loves and respects his or her spouse, believing spouse enough, that they want to live with that spouse in harmony, or at least relative harmony, they know that there are certain things that if you press those buttons, you're going to have war. And so when they're around that believing spouse, they don't say those kinds of things. But what's the result? The atmosphere in the home is much more holy. It's a much better atmosphere in which to raise the kids because they're not subjected to that kind of language and conversation. And so if the unbeliever is willing to stay in the home and doesn't want to leave just because you know Christ, that's good. Don't divorce him. Don't divorce her. Uh, it'll have some positive effects to the atmosphere in the home. Uh, and that's better than him going out and living with non-believers where maybe all they do is swear and talk about things that are very ungodly and unholy. Well, uh, I'm sure everyone, uh, as they first read this and afterwards, um, in Corinth and elsewhere, thinks, well, okay, but what if you're a believer and your spouse is a non-believer and it really angers him that you're a religious sort and he doesn't want to have anything, she doesn't want to have anything to do with you. Uh, what do you do then? Verses 52, uh, excuse me, 15 to 16. What to do when the non-believer says, I don't want to continue with this. He up and leaves. She up and leaves. But if the unbeliever leaves, let him do so. And we already know from reading the earlier verses that this rule would apply if the unbeliever is a woman. If the unbeliever leaves, let her do so. A believing man or woman, that confirms that the rule applies both to a believing man and to a believing woman. A believing man or woman is not bound in such circumstances. God has called us to live in peace. Now, in that verse, there are two things that are going on. First of all, the rule. The rule is let him do so. Let him depart. And let her depart because it applies to the woman as well. If she's the non-believer who wants to leave. Is not bound in such circumstances. That means you don't have to do this. But now class, here's where we've got to be very careful that we understand the details of this rule. Uh, would this verse allow the believer to divorce the non-believer if the non-believer wanted to stay and give the believer unbelievable grief? Yes. 
No. No. This is a very specific and narrow situation. And that situation is when there is a non-believing spouse who can't stand to continue to live with a believer. And so that's different from the situation where a non-believing spouse wants to live with the believer. That's what we got in verses 12 through 14. We saw the rule and the rationale for that. Uh, so this applies to a case where the non-believing spouse decides, I can't handle living with this religious fanatic. Probably what he thinks of her or of him. But then what does that mean? The believing spouse should initiate divorce proceedings while he's still living in the house but giving her grief? Uh-uh, doesn't say that she initiates divorce, proceed. Well, then, once he leaves, should she initiate divorce proceeding? Doesn't say that either. What it does say is let him do so, which means it's up to him to decide to move out and it's up to him to initiate the divorce proceeding. Her role is not to block it. Period. That's all she's given permission to do there. The end of verse 15, what is that? Well, actually, verses 15 and 16 give you the rationale for the rule that you get in the first part of verse 15. Uh, and there are two different, though not contradictory, reasons for this teaching. The first one is God has called us to live in peace. Well, what in the world? We all know that. What does that have to do with the situation? Oh, it has everything to do with the situation. If you have a non-believing spouse who can't stand his or her believing spouse and they really want to get out of the marriage but you force them to stay in that marriage, well, even before they decide that they want to leave the marriage, they're probably going to make that home hell on earth, right? Right? And if they say, I want to get out of this, and you try to block it, it's going to be hell on steroids in that home, right? Yeah. And that's not what God wants for his people, to live in constant turmoil like this. So the reason that God says, let the unbelieving spouse depart is that God knows that if you don't and this marriage continues, it could be hell on earth in that home and God doesn't want us to live in that kind of turmoil. So one of the reasons that God is willing to allow this divorce to happen is so that you can have peace, the believer and his children, the believer and her children can have a peaceful peaceful home life. But that's not the only reason. A lot of believing spouses try to block the non-believer from going because they think, oh, if I can just keep my husband here long enough and I keep witnessing to him enough, I'll eventually convert him. Or if I can just keep this close connection with her with my unbelieving wife, uh, eventually I'll be able to convert her. So I can't let her go. Uh, which is really kind of silly, isn't it? That, that a uh, totally sovereign, omnipotent God can only get your unbelieving husband saved if you're the one who brings the message. But if they hear the message from someone else, it would be impossible for them to get saved without you 
That's not true. We know better than that. Well, uh, verse 16 talks about this issue of how likely it is to get saved just by sticking together. And there are two totally opposite ways to read verse 16. And let me read it this way. Uh, let me read it both ways and you'll see the difference by my voice inflections, but you'll know that they're different as you hear this. And it's important to get the right way to read this clear in your minds or you could see verse 16 as contradicting the rule that's been laid down in verse 15. Uh, beside God saying, God ha Paul saying, God has called us to live in peace, uh, there's something else you need to know. How do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband? I mean, don't let him go. I mean, how, how can you be sure that if he stays here, you won't be able to save him? Keep him here. Or how do you know, husband, how do you know you won't be able to save your wife? I mean, maybe keep the marriage together. Or you can read it with the opposite emphasis. How do you know wife, whether you'll be able to save your unbelieving husband. In other words, what makes you think that you're going to convert him just by him continuing to live with you? You're delusional. Not part of the original. Uh, but that's, that's the idea. Same thing with the husband. Or how do you know, husband? You think we've got to keep this marriage intact no matter what because without it, he's not going to get saved. She's not going to get saved. But if they stay with me, they will. How do you know that you can save your unbelieving husband, wife? Or how do you know, believing husband, that you can save your unbelieving wife by just making sure she stays with you? Now, as I say, there, there, there are those two separate ways of reading this verse, and I'm sure you can see it does make a difference as to which way you read it. So, reading it the first way says you better continue the marriage because if you do, you can bring your spouse to the Lord. The second way of reading this says you better not convince, you know, if your only reason for continuing the marriage is you think you can convert your spouse, you're delusional, let him depart. Well, in the context of verses 15 and 16, which of those two ways of reading this do you think Paul means? Well, it's not hard to answer. What's the rule in verse 15? If he wants to depart, if she wants to depart, let him go. Let her go. Well, then having said, let him go, and saying the reason for that is God wants you to live in peace, is Paul going to turn around and say, oh, and by the way, don't let him go, because if you do, you'll lose the chance to convert him. No. Now, what Paul is saying is let him go and if you're worried that if you don't, he won't get saved, well, wait a minute. How can you be so sure that he'll get saved if you can just keep him in the home? So don't, don't push it. Now, that's consistent with let him depart. You got to keep it together because then you'll get him saved. That's not consistent with let him depart. And let him depart because God wants you to live in peace. Wait a minute, if I keep him in the home, I may not be able to convert him and I may continue this horrible, horrible situation. And you know what? If the unbelieving spouse is really nasty and angered by being forced to stay there, not only will he do his usual swearing and whatnot, 
and blaspheming of God and scripture and Christ, he may go out of his way to do things like that sort, of that sort, when he's around his wife, just to convince her, uh, well, maybe not to convince her, but to just antagonize her and try to drive her to agree. So, as I say, if he doesn't want to be there, it's going to be hell on earth, and if you force him, it's going to be hell on earth on steroids, potentially. So, what does this mean? What this teaching in 1 Corinthians 7, 15, and 16 means is there is a second ground for divorce. Uh, well, let's see. Well, what is it? Willful desertion of a believer by a non-believer. Let me repeat. Willful desertion of a believer by a non-believer. Now, notice what it doesn't say. It didn't say willful desertion of a believer, excuse me, of a non-believer by a believer. It's not the believer who can take the initiative either to leave or to divorce. Uh, it has to be the non-believer who takes the initiative to leave and to initiate the divorce proceedings. Well, what happens if my husband just can't stand living with me, but he's not interested in getting married to anyone else, so he's just going to leave and he's not going to initiate divorce proceedings, so we're not living together, but we're still married. Can't I go ahead and divorce him? No. Not on the grounds that he up and left. It's his initiative. Well then, am I, do I have no way out of this marriage? Well, if you get word that while he's gone, he's committing some form of pornea, then you have a ground for divorce and you can initiate proceedings. But if he doesn't, you have no recourse at that point. But it's not totally bad news. At least you're not having to live in the midst of all the grief and strife that result from this non-believer who doesn't want to be there being there anyway. So what you can see from all of this discussion is that what I would say is I think there are two grounds for divorce. Pornea or willful desertion of a believer by a non-believer. If it's pornea, the believer can initiate the proceedings. If it's willful desertion, it's only the non-believer who can initiate the divorce proceedings. Now, um, why would God, in, uh, beyond the rationale that's given in verses 15 and 16, why would God be willing to allow that non-believer to divorce his believer. I mean, isn't the marriage bond between the two spouses still intact? Well, evidently what Paul is saying is willful desertion of a believer just because he or she is a believer, that's a turning away from your commitment to cling to that person and be faithful in all ways, not just sexually, but in all ways to that person, you have broken that promise. I mean, if, if the marriage bond hasn't been broken by him leaving, then it means he's gone and they're still married in God's eyes. But why would God say you can divorce someone if the divorce isn't going to break the marriage bond or if it hadn't been broken already. So it must be that God sees this move of getting out of the house because it's a believer and I don't want to have anything to do with her anymore as a way to break the marriage bond. Well then, if the marriage bond is broken and God is allowing divorce, then 
He doesn't say anything about remarrying, but wouldn't logic say you would be, both partners would be free to remarry? I mean, to marry someone else will not, will establish another marriage bond, but it won't be you have a marriage bond with your second spouse and one with your first spouse so that by marrying someone else you'll be committing adultery. No. Now, I recognize that Paul doesn't go into whether in this situation you can remarry, but I don't think it's impossible for us to figure that out if you know the basis of divorcing is that the marriage bond has been broken and why would God let divorce happen here if the marriage bond hadn't been broken? And if it hadn't been and you weren't to remarry, wouldn't Paul have said so? Because the natural reaction for both the believing and the non-believing spouse after the divorce occurs is to go and marry someone else, right? In that culture and probably to a certain extent in our cultures. So uh, that's where I am on this issue and why. There's a whole lot more to say <clears throat> than just this, but these are the basic things I'd like to present. But I'd like to add something else, a couple of other things, and then I'm going to stop on this topic. I'm sure some of you are, as you're thinking this through, and you may say, okay, I, I can agree with what the professor is saying. But then, what does that mean? <clears throat> uh, suppose a woman has a husband who is a tyrant and abusive and he beats her and he terrorizes the kids, but this isn't, I mean, they're both believers or they're both non-believers, so 1 Corinthians 7 doesn't apply. And this husband has never committed porneia. Uh, wouldn't beating your wife be equivalent to porneia? Well, no, folks. There is no evidence of biblical usage for porneia to refer to that. So then what does that mean? The wife has no recourse. She can't do anything and she just has to submit to being uh, pummeled by her husband and her kids terrorized. Uh, is, is that what you're saying? Uh, it probably sounds like that's what I'm saying but that's why I want to say the next thing. That's why I'm addressing this. Number one, no, I don't think she is required to endanger her physical, mental, emotional well-being or that of the kids. Oh, well, then she can divorce. No. Well, then what? Well, there's at least a couple of things she can do. Number one is separation of bed and board. If you're a pastor and you know of a situation like this and porneia has not been committed and let's say the husband is a non-believer and the spouse is a believer, but he doesn't want to depart. There's no ground for divorce, but what you need to do is gently or maybe forcefully say, we need to move you and your kids out of this house. And if that's not going to keep him from coming after you, we need to get a court order that he has to remain away from you. But that's not divorce. No, it isn't. But you've got to protect life and limb. Well, someone might say, you know, that sounds good and that, that would be good as a first step. But my husband, he still controls the checkbook at least as much as I do and he's extremely irresponsible and he's piling up all kinds of debts and we're liable for those debts and it's going to sink us. Can't I divorce him? No. But there is something you can do. 
you can file for legal separation. It's not a divorce, but what it does is it releases you from the responsibility of being liable for his debts. Um, wow. Aren't you sort of inclined to say if those are the rules, who in their right mind would ever want to get married? Do you see why the disciples reacted as they did? Please, I'm not trying to justify them. What they said is pathetic. Just be sure that you don't have the same pathetic reaction. You're not verbalizing it, but don't think it. Yeah, the rules are hard. And you know what? The rules aren't fair. The rules aren't fair. Because you know what? Someone can know the rules and manipulate them. Uh, there can be a husband and wife who are married and the scenario I'm going to tell you is based on a true story. Uh, there can be a husband and a wife who are married and the husband wants to continue this but the wife doesn't. She's decided she doesn't want to be married to him uh, and she doesn't want to marry anybody else and you know, it's not, there's no evidence that she's a lesbian. So she just moves out of the house and she doesn't file for divorce. And she hasn't had sex with another man or with a woman. So there's not pornea and maybe that wife is a believer and the husband is a believer. So 1 Corinthians 7 can't apply. And now she's free of him and uh, she can go and pursue a second career and so she does. She goes to a university and gets an MBA and goes into business and, you know, never gets married, just abstains from sex. And he believes he's got to follow scripture and he can't see that... Um, She's committed pornea, and this isn't a 1 Corinthians 7 thing. He would love to still have her as his wife, but she's not interested. They even have gone to counseling, and they've gotten nowhere with her. And uh, he knows he doesn't have grounds for divorce, and so what that means is he can't, get remarried and it means he can't have children and he's not going to have grandchildren and when this happens he's only about 29 or 30 years old and life looks very bleak and you listen to that and you say that's really not fair that he's stuck in this no it isn't but those are the rules I didn't make them God did and let me add one other thing to the story that I'm telling you. It is a real story. I'm talking about someone who was a student, an MDiv student at Trinity, preparing for ministry. And, uh, you know, his wife was a normal red-blooded gal who had a variety of needs, including sexual and he was so gung-ho on studying that he, did, he paid more attention to his studies than he did to his wife. And she got tired of this and up and left. Um, and <clears throat> once she left the home, <clears throat> initially he was hoping to be able <clears throat> to uh, speak with her and go to counseling and they did and he admitted that he was wrong and then that he hadn't paid enough attention to her etc cetera, etc cetera. and her only response was well I just don't feel like I want to be married to you during the time when this was happening he switched out of the MDiv program into an MA in philosophy of religion and he eventually graduated with the MA PR because he knew that with this happening, he'd never minister anywhere. And when he graduated, he wasn't really eager to go on for doctoral work. 
And there aren't a whole lot of secular universities who on the basis of an MAPR from a religious institution that most secular universities are going to look at as fundamentalists. Uh, there's, there's no university that's going to take you into a PhD program on that basis. And in a way, it's a blessing that none would <clears throat> because if you went and you made it through the program and you had your PhD in philosophy, where are you going to teach? Secular universities aren't going to want you. And what Christian university, let alone theological seminary, is going to hire you to teach MDiv students? And uh, so he graduated, went back home to Quincy, Illinois, and he was involved in police work, I think, social work. And last time I talked with him was many, many years ago. And he said, uh, I said, how are you doing? He said, it's been tough. Life looks to me like this long, long, dark tunnel, and there's no light at the end. Um, I haven't heard from him. I, and let me just tell you, he was so determined to follow biblical rules and he knew what they were and so he even hired a private investigator to tail his wife to see whether maybe she was taking up a relationship with another man or with some woman and that Pornea would be committed and then he'd have grounds to divorce her and it turned out nothing. She didn't. Now, I'm telling you that story, and there are other sad ones like it, although that's probably the saddest that I've come across. Because the final thing I want to tell you and emphasize to you is in a way more important than anything I've said on, MD, uh, on uh, divorce and remarriage. Men and women tend to your marriages. Take care of your wife. Take care of your husband. It is more important that your marriage holds together than that you pass this class, let alone get an A in it. It is more important that your marriage holds together than, you get, than that you get your MDiv because class, if you graduate from master's with your MDiv but without your marriage, you don't have anything. You aren't going to minister. You say, that's not fair. I mean, the, the churches won't even listen to the story. Sad to say, no, they won't. You've seen how long it takes to explain all this. <laughs> what church do you think is going to allow you eight hours to explain the biblical teaching and then they're going to listen to your story and say, oh yeah, you're, yeah, you were the innocent party and sure will consider you the truth of the matter is it's not always fair but if you're an evangelical at this point in history and you have a divorce and remarriage or just a divorce regardless of the story you aren't going to be in ministry and you know I've seen a number of students come to Trinity who were divorced and remarried Boy, one, one fellow who came first or second year I was there, this guy was absolutely brilliant. He had a PhD in computer science. He was a full professor in computer science at Ohio State University, and he was so good that at times he was brought to Washington, D.C. to consult people on all of that. And at a certain point, he felt God was calling him to full-time ministry. He'd had a divorce, and if you heard the story, you'd say he's the innocent party. I don't know that either party, when there's a divorce, is totally innocent, but you would say, well, you know, he didn't want the divorce. He didn't leave her. It was the other way around. He there had been a divorce and a remarriage, but he felt God has definitely called me to ministry. So you know what he did? He resigned his position at Ohio State, and he and his wife moved to Deerfield, actually 
not that suburb, but not far from the school, and he started the MDiv. And this guy was absolutely brilliant. And he was sure that God had called him and there was going to be some sort of ministry when he was done. And you know what happened? That he, as you would expect, got involved in a local church and the people saw what a great guy he is and brilliant. And he thought, as my Christian service, I, I'd like to teach a Sunday school class. And obviously he was a great teacher and he was gaining all kinds of biblical and theological knowledge. And when they heard about his background or they knew about it, they said no. Wouldn't even let him teach an adult Sunday school class. And gradually he got the, impression, uh, the, the message. And do you know to this very day, I don't think he's graduated with that MDiv. For many years, he stayed living in that suburb, went back to his computer business, uh, started uh, another computer business or, or joined up with the firm, never went back into teaching. And I see people who come to Trinity for PhD studies in the theological studies program which includes systematic theology old testament new testament church history and they've had a divorce and remarriage but they're sure god's called them to a teaching ministry and so that's going to make up for everything and you don't have the heart to tell them otherwise but you know where that's going to end up there's only one of those people that i know of who's come through i was the first reader on his dissertation who's gotten a job in teaching, but you know what? There's no seminary that'll let him teach, though he'd be a really good one. He's teaching at a Christian college, which will allow someone divorced and remarried, and this is another one of those cases where um, it was the wife who decided she was done with it. Um, there are very, very few churches that will even talk with you about a pastoral position or schools that will talk with you about a teaching position if you are divorced and remarried. They won't sit down and listen to your story and if they did, they wouldn't know what to make of it because they don't know the stuff that we've talked about these last two days. So I hate to be the bearer of this news but if you've got a divorce and remarriage or you're thinking about it, you should know that the current state of evangelicalism is that you're not going to have much of a ministry, if, if any. Which then means what? Work on your marriages. If I could give you academic credit for taking your wife out to dinner tonight, I would. <laughs> now, I don't do that. I can't do that. But I'm still encouraging you, guys, when you get back home, if it's tonight or what, take your wife out to dinner. Pay attention to her. Work on that relationship. It is Critical because if you get out of this seminary with your degree but not with your wife, you haven't done, you haven't gotten anything. And you know who really wins? Satan. Because you've spent all this time and energy and money preparing to serve and Satan has snuffed it out before you even get a chance to use it. And wouldn't that delight him terrifically? Um, I can't emphasize this enough. We've got to get rid of the Hollywood view of marriage. What is that view? That two people with full hearts and empty heads fall into <laughs> love hopelessly and everything works without any effort they live happily ever after no 
doesn't work that way. And the place to begin to work at it, if you aren't yet married, but you're dating and you're hoping to get married, is that courtship period. Talk about things, your values, what's important to you, what isn't. Get to know what that prospective spouse thinks and is. Don't just say, oh, I just love her so much and I think God wants me to marry her and everything will fall into place. No, it doesn't by itself. And when you have married that person, you still have to work at it. After you said, I do, the courtship needs to continue. Uh, you're not going to be the same person you uh, five years after the marriage or even one year after the marriage that you were before the marriage. So why should you think she is and that she's already gotten enough love for you from you so I don't have to work at it anymore? Would that be an acceptable way to love God? Is that the way he loves us? Well, I've given them some love and it's enough, so let me look. That's not how God loves us and how we're supposed to love him and that's not how we should love our spouse. Now, please don't misunderstand. I am not saying your studies are unimportant and you should neglect them. What I am saying is you don't dare neglect your wife or your husband if you are married. Figure out a way to work hard at both. But if you have to sacrifice one or the other, don't sacrifice your marriage because if you don't have your marriage, you don't have anything when you get out of here. You're not likely to have much opportunity for ministry. Uh, yes, I know God can open doors for you if you're divorced and remarried. And I hope and pray that he will. And if you're in that situation, I would ask other Christians to pray that God will. Um, but if you are not divorced and remarried... Don't think that, oh, well, I can just sort of take or leave my marital relationship because God wants me in ministry, and regardless of what happens, uh, God will see that I get a pastorate. God has not obligated himself to do that. Um, take steps to make sure your marriage stays together. I say, if I could give you academic credit for taking your wife out, not just tonight and then you ignore her for the next month, that's not the point, but look, she's been sacrificing this whole week so that you could be here. And you've been focusing on your studies in this class and your fellowship with other members of the class. Focus on her totally. This eve, even if you have to preach tomorrow, spend some time with your wife tonight. And after you're done with the preaching spe tomorrow, spend the rest of the day with her. 